Uh, absolutely delighted uh, to have Arthur Eisencraft here. Uh, Professor Eisencraft is a very good friend of uh, Azim Primji Foundation. It's not his first visit to India, obviously, uh, but for us, uh, it's uh, his second visit in uh, in a year's time, right? Spent a few days with us last time. Absolutely enchanting, absolutely captivating. He's in the midst of another week with us. Absolutely enchanting and absolutely captivating. Uh, we thought that uh, we must share this with the public at large. And even though it was uh, around uh, end of year uh, time when many of us were having a break, we quickly uh, organized with Arthur and requested him, could he please do a public lecture uh, with us? And it took him about a few microseconds to get back to us and say, yes, I'm on. Uh, another e email exchange with Arthur on what would you like to talk about and uh, so on and so forth. And here you have, without looking at it, I can tell you, engaging students in science with art, physics, and literature. Uh, that's on the screen. Uh, Professor Eisencraft uh, is uh, obviously a very distinguished science education person, highly decorated, highly fated, and as you could see in the announcement that we sent to you, a person who could uh, keep us absolutely captivated on the wealth of oh, a lot of wonderful work he's done over many, many years. Uh, much in demand for inputs and advice on how we could take science education forward. For us at Azim Premji Foundation, and that includes the university, uh, we often grapple with uh, what to do with science pedagogy. For example, interestingly, math pedagogy, science pedagogy, all is part of a curriculum. And therefore, uh, to us, it's more than just a passing interest. It's, it's probably deeply connected with the very purpose of our university. Um, Professor Eisencraft, over to you. I promised you that it will be a very simple introduction, and I kept it like that. I've not read any of it from that paper that I have in my hand. Over to you, folks, and over to you, sir. Well, thank you very much, and it, and it really is my pleasure to be here. So I have to begin by asking you a question so I can find out who you are. Um, I, I don't know who you are, and since my talk includes some physics and could include equations if you like them. I have to know how many you want. So um, on a scale of 0 to 10, with 0 being I don't know any physics whatsoever, and 10 being I can solve any physics problem you can give me, would you rate yourself 0 to 3, 4 to 6, 7 to 9, or 10? So with a show of hands, how many people would say they're 0 to 3? A little physics. OK. Four to six. Ah. Seven to nine? Ten? Does anybody want to say ten? OK. Yeah. It's good that we, we realize our humility, but uh, not always. OK, so let me begin by telling you a, a story about um, a, a, a magazine um, that we were producing. And I had to write articles for this magazine. The articles were going to be physics articles, but they were also going to include a physics problem to do, and the publisher of the magazine was going to put pictures in it. And the first, pic the first two articles, he put, they put pictures in, and I wasn't happy with them, but I could live with them. Then they put another picture in the third article, and I hated the picture. It just bothered me so much. It was a terrible picture. And so I said to the publisher, I know somebody who draws cartoons. Would it be possible to have the person I know make the illustrations for the magazine? And they were very nervous. He knows somebody who knows how to draw. They weren't quite sure what this meant. But I had approached Tomas Bunk, and I said, can you illustrate my physics articles? And he says, I can, but I don't know any physics. I said, I know. That's why I think I want you to do it. I said, the first article is about light. How would you draw light? And he said, and it took him only 15 seconds, he thought, and he said, I would draw light as a superhero because it goes so fast. And I said, that's why I want you to do it, because it'll be a different kind of picture than we usually see. So in the first article, we have light traveling and hitting a mirror and going through water and going through a prism. And you can see the superhero light doing what it's supposed to do. 
And Tomas sent me the picture, and I, and I said, it's wonderful, but there's a little problem. When light leaves the water, it wouldn't leave this way, it would leave this way. And so we have to change that because it's not good. Can you change that bit of light? And he said, I can, but I have to change the whole picture. And I said, no, no, I just need the light. He said, it's a painting, Arthur. We have to change the whole thing. I said, you know what? Let's leave it. And so I wrote down at the bottom of the article, light is misbehaving here. Can you find out where? <laughs> and so now, when people say, oh, the light is driven, you say, that, that was the puzzle. That was part of the puzzle. Can you find that? What was also charming, I thought, was that he told me, because he researches his pictures, and so he looks in physics books and things to draw. And he said, it seems in physics you're always afraid people won't understand the pictures, so you label them M1 for mirror one, H2O, so they know it's water. <laughs> so I labeled them for you because I thought physics people would like to know these labels. And then, of course, um, he began to have a little bit of fun because that's the way he draws. And so I don't know, it might be too small for you to see, but here's a person on the ladder holding the, um, the, the rim and the, there's somebody underneath who's sawing away and hurts the dog and is sawing away and this whole thing will collapse in no time at all. But, um, and then I chose as a quotation, before we get to the physics article, Ovid's quotation, the cause is hidden but the effect is known. You see, we know that light reflects off a mirror. You know that every day when you wake up in the morning and you look in the mirror. You know the light reflects, but we don't know why. We don't know why does the light reflect off a mirror, but it goes through the water. The cause is hidden, but the effect is known. So what we have is we have the literature, the cartoon, and then we get into a, a very nice physics problem which, um, which talks about how light could travel um, on, on a wall or through a medium or something like that. So this is the idea. Quantoons, the book was called Quantum. The magazine was called Quantum. And these were cartoons, so we began to call them Quantoons at a much later time. So for this one, I have to teach you a little physics in case you don't know it. Um, this is a pendulum. And in a pendulum, the thing you have to know is that when a pendulum um, moves back and forth, it turns out that it moves back and forth. And so when, if the pendulum is long, it goes back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. But if the pendulum is short, it goes back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. That's why when you're walking with your little child, you walk like this, and they, their legs go very, very fast. Because they have, they have short legs, so they go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And your long legs go back and forth, back and forth. The other thing you have to know about pendula, which we teach in school all the time, is that if the pendula are the same length, if the pendula are the same length, it doesn't matter how much the mass is. This one has two washers. This one only has one washer. But if they're the same length, which we can do here, then you can see that they both go at the same rate. So heavy one, light one, they go at the same rate. So the length matters, the mass doesn't. Okay. So that every school book does. But for here, we wanted to give it a, a little special puzzle. So we had a pendulum which would leak water. So here we have the pendulum. It goes from A to B. But as it goes from A to B, water leaks out of the pendulum. So the water level goes from the top down, 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 and as the water leaks out. And the question is, as the water leaks out, does the pendulum go faster, slower, or does it stay the same? You have to, you're supposed to think about these for just a moment. <laughs> just a moment. You're such good students. Um, for those of you who know a lot of physics, I don't want you to worry about the water coming out. Just think of it this way. It goes from A to B, then we pour water out. It goes from A to B, we pour water out, we go from A to B. So let's take a vote. Um, how many people say that the pendulum will go as the water goes faster and faster? Nobody or nobody's voting. How many people say it stays the same? Wonderful. And how many people say it goes slower? Wonderful. Well, it turns out 
all three answers are correct, so everybody can feel good. <laughs> and you say, well, wait, what do you mean all three can be correct? Well, this isn't a school exam. I can show you why all three are... You see, the lesson you learned was that the mass doesn't matter. Only the length matters. And so you said, wait, I think it goes the same back and forth because I learned the mass doesn't matter, so it doesn't matter how much mass there is. And so you learned that lesson well, and most of you got full credit. However, some of you said, but wait a second. How do you measure the length of the pendulum? Do you measure the length of a pendulum from the top to the top of the tub, the middle of the tub, or the bottom of the tub? And it turns out we measure it from the middle of the, the middle, the center of mass. And so in this case, when the tub is filled, it's at the Band-Aid. Right there, a little bandage there. And so it goes back and forth. But as the water leaks out of the pendulum, the center of the mass of water goes down, and so the pendulum effectively gets longer. And therefore, it would slow down. So the slow down people get credited also. But that's not the whole story. When all the water comes out, the center of mass goes back up to the bandage. And now it speeds up again. So if you like, we can do a graph about this. And you can see that if the container has no mass, then the period gets longer and longer and longer. It keeps slowing down because the pendulum gets longer and longer. And although this looks like a straight line, it's not. If I put a little, it's not. So if you do the math, it's not a straight line. But if it's a massive container, it goes slower, slower. And then at some point, when the water gets too low, the center of mass goes up, and it starts speeding up again, as it was at the beginning. Sure. The reduction of mass, the distance traveled at the curvature, at the maximum point of that uh, whatever container, will it increase or decrease? The amplitude. Uh, the, 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 yeah. the, time, the, the time, it's traveling, right? The, the time, the time changes, yeah. Uh, so the distance at this. Yes, yeah, so you're saying how far it goes? Yeah. Will it get reduced or? I, I, I don't know. We'll have to do that one. Because <laughs> the mass is getting reduced, uh, the distance traveled at the furthest point, uh, will have to, that should vary. Yeah. Well, as I said, the way I asked you to look at it was to say, go from A to B, pour the water out, go from A to B, pour the water out. So it's not continuous, because once you do that, you do have to start worrying about the momentum effects with the water coming out and giving a kick to the pail and things like that. So it's, 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 it depends on how you want to frame it. But I framed it where you pour it out, you start over, so we don't have to worry about that effect. OK. Um, so here's a question about mirrors, another question about mirrors. And What's wonderful about this is that um, this is a toy you can buy in some places where you have one mirror, then you have another mirror on top, and you put uh, a one rupee coin at the bottom, and you see the one rupee coin on the top. When you try to grab it, there's nothing there because it's just an image. And um, it turns out that if you have one of those toys, you'll see the rupee coin at the top, but as you lift this, you can see it again when you get far ahead. And the students had to, uh, the, the people looking at this, had to compute that. But the quotation is by Goethe, a very famous poet. And he was describing mirrors. Mirror facing, facing mirror. Doubles exquisite effect. Between them in the shadow stands a crystal cube which will reflect. The crystal cube is the mirror. But what I liked so much about this is mirror facing, facing mirror. With language, he did what the mirror does. Mirror facing, facing mirror. So I just thought that was wonderful. And then, of course, Tomas had these wonderful, idea, just wonderful illustrations. So here's somebody going into the mirror, which you can't do. Don't try this. You can't go into the mirror like that. And then you have somebody looking in the mirror, and they're very pleased with how handsome they look. And this person's looking in the mirror and not pleased at all, because it looks like they're dead. And then if you look over here, you have people looking in this curved mirror, which you know distorts things. And what my favorite, though, is that this cubist person looks quite normal in the mirror. <laughs> so again, engaging people through the cartoon or engaging people through the literature to maybe want to look at the physics problem and see if they understand the physics. Sometimes we use these quantoons before we even begin the lessons in physics. So here's 
a very um, famous physics problem we like to give. The problem is that you have to move your boat from A to B. We're always going from A to B, it seems. We go from A to B. Now, if the river is not flowing, then we know you just go straight across and it takes a certain amount of time. But if the river is flowing and you start going from A to B, you start getting pulled downstream. And so if you try going straight across, you're pulled downstream, and then when you get to the shore, you have to walk up. So it takes more time. So maybe the idea is to go upstream. So you, What's the best path to get to B from A to B in the least time if the river is flowing? And we know how fast you can go across and how fast the river is flowing. So that was the idea of this. And of course, there are some uh, lovely little things like the three men in a tub here and there cooking on the way down. But we had this illustration, and we had this nice physics problem. And I have this quote, Heraclitus. It is not possible to step into the same river twice. Why not? Why isn't it possible to step into the same river twice? Anybody have any idea what Heraclitus? The water keeps flowing, so the river is changing. It's never the same river. It, so you think it means it is not possible to step into the same river twice because of the water flowing, it's always a different river. Or maybe you can never step into the same river twice because you are always changing. <laughs> Tomorrow, you're a different person than you are today. And so maybe that's what he means. But that's just a way to puzzle it. When Tomas drew this picture, I said, oh, that's a fun picture. That's good. Here's Einstein on a sailboat. That's nice. <laughs> and then when I asked Tomas um, later on, I said, Tomas, tell me more about the pictures and your creative exercise. How do you draw these pictures? And he said, well, for instance, this one, I don't think you looked carefully enough at it. I said, well, yes, I see. Going A to B, and then you have the, he said, no, no, no. Let me write, let me tell you about this picture. Through the image streams a river with two very different shores on each side. The one symbolizes life, the other death. The life side is the sunny side. People are enjoying themselves under the tree of life, eating, drinking, writing, painting. The opposite side is the dark side where the trees are chopped down and time stands still. Our hero has to paddle across the river from point A to point B, but God forbid life would be that easy. The river is wild and treacherous, and he gets dragged downstream undergoing several life-threatening misadventures until he reaches the other shore as an old man. <coughs> now he has to drag himself up to, point, to get to point B as planned, where he apparently bites the dust. Though we see him right after that, resurrected as a young boy, crossing the river to the shore of the living again. Some people never get enough. <laughs> it's just a cartoon. Don't worry about it. <laughs> the depth of what he's thinking about when he draws something like this, I never noticed life and death. The river is your life. So again, um, it's wonderful because Tomas, remember, does not know physics. And yet he uses physics to understand, he uses the cartoons to understand the physics and to make sense of it. So there's something called the photoelectric effect, which uh, you have to learn if you're in school. So let me give you the school knowledge of the photoelectric effect. Um, there, if light hits a piece of metal, if light hits a piece of metal, the occasionally, sometimes, when the light hits the metal, an electron will jump off. Photo, light, electric, electron, photoelectric effect, that's the name of it. A very important problem in physics um, because nobody could figure out the details of it. We knew the details, but again, nobody could figure out why this would happen. Let me tell you about these strange <coughs> details. When the light comes down on the metal, sometimes electrons are free and sometimes electrons are not freed. If you use a red light, electrons are never freed. If you have a little red light, no electrons. A big red light, no electrons. A, a, 
a blinding red light, no electrons. But if you just turn the light to violet, and you shine a little violet light, little tiny, all these electrons start coming off. A bigger violet light, even more. And you say, wait, why the intense red light, nothing happens, but the little tiny violet light, these electrons start coming off. That was the puzzle. And nobody could solve the puzzle until Einstein came in 1905. This is what he won the Nobel Prize for. And so when I try to explain the physics of this, kinetic energy of the electrons equal to the energy of the electrons minus the work function, it's a little difficult for students. So we came up with an analogy. Every student knows about vending machines, I think, even in India. So I want to tell you this is a special vending machine. The vending machine only takes coins, it doesn't take bills. So you have a one rupee coin, a two rupee, a five rupee, and a ten rupee coin. That's, those are the coins you have? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So to buy the potato chips, it costs five rupees. Five rupees. This vending machine is not a very good vending machine. It doesn't allow you to add money. So if you put in five one rupee coins, it won't give you potato chips. Every time you put a one rupee coin in, it comes out. Every time you, it can't add up. Well, what would happen if you went to this machine and you put in a two rupee coin? It's, it comes out. What if you use a five rupee coin? Oh, you put five rupees in and the potato chips come out. What if you put three two rupee coins? Then all three come out. What if you put a ten rupee coin in? Ah, the potato chips come out and you get a five rupee coin for change. <laughs> right, that's what happens in a bit. Good. So that's how the photoelectric effect worked. That was the solution to the photoelectric effect. It's like a vending machine. The red light is made up of one rupee coins. And the electron to be freed needs five rupees. That's the cost of freeing the electron. So no matter how much red light you have, one, 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 change the yellow light, two, 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 nothing's happening. But with the violet light, even a tiny bit is five, you get an electron. The tiniest light, you still get one. lots of violet light, lots of five rupee coins, lots of potato chips, lots of electrons. And if you use a ten rupee coin, the five rupee change you get is how fast the electron, now the electron doesn't just leave, it leaves and it goes somewhere very fast. So that's the photoelectric effect. And here's the cartoon, the quantoon. The quantoon is that here we have our yellow light. All these potato chips are bound with chains and, and a ball and chain to the metal. You know it's metal because here's the Tin Man from The Wizard of Oz. And the yellow light is coming, and uh, they're free. Free at last. Free at last. You know, they're, they're all happy. But the red light, nothing's happening. <laughs> that potato chip is stuck. Now here's the vending machine, and here this is. Now, to solve this problem, because it's like, really, Einstein won a Nobel Prize? I know how a vending machine works. Where's my Nobel Prize? <laughs> the problem was, until 1905, everybody was certain that light was a wave. Light was a wave. Light is a wave. But to answer the puzzle of the photoelectric effect, Einstein had to say, no, in this problem, light is a particle and not a wave. In all those other ones, it's still a wave, but now it's a particle. It's like, how could it be? But that was what Einstein was able to deduce. So for the quote, I chose something from the Bhagavad Gita. When Krishna says to Arjun, have other eyes new light, and look, this is my glory unveiled to mortal sight. Have other eyes new light. The light is new now. It's a particle. And look. This is my glory unveiled to mortal sight. So maybe Krishna was thinking of the photoelectric effect. Maybe. <laughs> this one is kind of an interesting puzzle for the physics people here. Um, you'll, you'll have a couple of minutes to try to solve this, or if you get tired, you can solve it um, during the rest of the talk or on your way home. This is a lens, and it's a split lens. What happens is a lens produces an image, like a magnifying glass or so many things. But you can take the lens and break it in half. 
It would be like taking my eyeglass and breaking the lens in half. So now I have two halves. And the question is, if I have one object here, we know what one lens can do. It can make an image, like the image you see of the projector or the image you see in a movie theater. But what happens if you have one object and now you have the lens as two pieces? What happens to the image? That was the problem. That's the physics problem. It's a wonderful physics problem. When I told Tomas and explained the physics to him of this so he could do the illustration, he called me up and he said, um, Arthur, is it all right if I could be political? And I said, how political? He said, well, I'd like to make a political statement. I said, it's a cartoon. Nobody cares. Do what you want to do. Nobody's paying that much attention. So Tomas did this cartoon. And let me tell you what Tomas described as the creative aspect of this. After reading the title of this article, I decided immediately to use it for my illustration. Split image. Split is where I was born and where I grew up, a beautiful city on the Mediterranean coast of Croatia. Looking back on my childhood, Split meant always the most perfect place. The temperate climate, the azure blue sea, the town rich in history founded by the Romans. But in 1995, when I drew this illustration, bloody war was raging, which shattered my image of a perfect paradise. The illustration shows the sunny past, but under the fractured lens, we see the sinister side, the destruction and death. Today, 10 years later, the fragments of the broken lens have grown together into one piece, and the light passes through is per pure and perfect again. So, Imagine now Tomas as a student. He finds the physics as a catharsis, as a way to describe something which is bothering him, and he's able to feel better about what he's dealing with through the art he can do to illustrate the physics. And you say, well, should he get credit for physics? This is a physics class. Does he know physics? Well, he does. He gets the physics correct. Here's the candle. Here's the lens. It makes an image here. Then it hits a mirror, so it right angles. And then it goes up. But of course, here it's burning the earth. Do we give our students the opportunity to write a poem? Do we give our students the opportunity to make a picture so that they can take the physics and personalize it and make it something about them? So light, light can be a wave or a particle. Maybe a student wants to express how they sometimes feel like a wave and a particle. Sometimes they feel this way, and sometimes they feel that way, and sometimes they feel both, not at the same time, but one right after the other. Maybe there's a way to use the physics as a metaphor for their own lives to make meaning of the physics, while also learning the physics. So for those of you who care about the lens, here's a very typical problem. You have uh, an arrow, and then the lens, and then there's a little arrow here. So if this is your object right at the base of the arrow, then you would have the image right here at the base of the arrow. So there are the two dots, object and image. When you break the lens, the object now gets two images. It gets one from this part and one from that part. So you have two. And when you study physics, as soon as you see two light sources from the same original source, we have to name them, S1 and S2. <laughs> we always name them. And then when you have S1 and S2, you know they will interfere and produce an interference pattern somewhere down here. And of course, the students had to calculate the interference pattern. <coughs> this picture, well, this article, the picture was a success. This article was a failure. Um, I, it was a failure because I asked people to, do so, to tell me something, and they all told me, a disappointing story. In physics, we always study um, objects being thrown in the air. You know, um, you know, that's what we like to do in physics. Is if I throw this object at this speed, where will it land? This really gives us a, good, a big thrill. <laughs> and so what happens is, if you look in the textbooks in America, in the United States, in the 1950s, when you look at the textbooks, 
the problems are, we're going to throw this object, but the object is always a mortar shell or a bomb or some kind of uh, weapon. And it made sense. It was the 1950s. We had just defeated the Nazis in World War II. We were feeling very good about ourselves. And so, yeah, let's, let's shoot some mortar shells. Let's do you know, some bombs. Let's do that. Missiles. In the 1980s in America, when you look at the physics books, then we're not throwing bombs. We're throwing baseballs and footballs and uh, cricket balls. And we're throwing all these things in the air. All these sports, the volleyballs, the badminton. And so the problems are the same problem, but the content is different. And then in the 1990s, in the physics books, now it's not bombs, and it's not baseballs or soccer balls or footballs. It's instrument packages. It's food packages. These people need help. Let's send them a food package. Let's send them an instrument package. Let's send them a, something to save them. And so, again, we know the physics problem is always solved the same way, but I ask the readers of this magazine, all physics people, does it matter? When you write a physics problem in your class, does it matter if you use a bomb, for the example, or a, or a football, or a food package? And most of them wrote back saying, no, it doesn't matter. And it broke my heart, because I think it matters very much. I think when you give problems to students, the context of the problem is telling you about values and what physics is good for. And if you only talk about bombs, there will be people who say, I don't like physics. So in America, when we have little children and we give them a problem for arithmetic, we say um, one apple plus two apples equals three apples. And they learn their arithmetic. And maybe in India you use apples, or maybe you say two mangoes and three mangoes make five mangoes. But those, that's how we learn arithmetic. In Nicaragua, in the 1980s, all the children were learning two machine guns and three machine guns equals five machine guns. <laughs> now, you, you might think it's, it was not funny. They were going through a revolution, and this was important to them. And you shape a culture by the context of the problems you give. So every time you choose the context for your problem in physics, or any subject, you have to think about how will this be interpreted by our students? Will it be interpreted in terms of social justice? Will it be in terms of maintaining the status quo? What will it be about? And that's the choice we have to make. So I was disappointed. And you can see Tomas did this wonderful illustration with there are bombs, but there are also food packages and things like that. And there's Einstein playing his violin and he, um, stuff like that. This problem was just fun. It turned, and you should. So um, usually I would give this to my students, and I would say, so what is this about? What's the physics of this? And if they know the physics, they can say, oh, this is the Compton effect. You see, when Einstein said that light can behave like a particle, people said, is that the only time in the photoelectric effect? And Compton said, no, no, probably if the light hits something, like an electron, if it gives some of its energy to the electron, then the wavelength of the light should change, the color of the light should change, and using Einstein's equation, I can predict that, and it turned out to be correct again. So here you have the light of one wavelength coming in, hitting the electron that's sleeping, and now the electron is moving, and it goes off, and the light goes off with a different wavelength and a different color. And because it's x-rays that are given off, you have all these x-ray pictures over here. And then Einstein hitchhiking over here. <laughs> So again, in, you have the profound, the life and death, the politics of Croatia, or you have the, just the fun of uh, you know, the, the traffic. This one it was, again, you know, shows kind of the details. So I love the quote by the conductor, Pierre Boulez. Revolutions are celebrated when they are no longer dangerous. So, where did the word revolu revolutions, where does that come from? Well, when Copernicus said that the Earth revolves around the sun, that was a revolutionary idea. 
It was a revolution. Copernicus talked about the revolution. And everybody else said, oh, that's a revolutionary idea. You know, I mean, there were people who, before Copernicus, when they used to say the earth goes around the sun, they just burned them at the stake. Giordano Bruno was like, burn them at the stake. You can't say that. Copernicus said, no, it, a revolutionary idea. And then it becomes anything so novel, so new, becomes a revolution. And then we have this. So what Tomas did was he had a good time with uh, revolutions. This problem, in terms of the physics, is very complex. There's a ride at Disneyland where you sit in a teacup, and the teacup goes round and round and round, and the whole platform with all the teacups goes round and round and round. So here you can see the gear of the whole thing moving. And the idea, so if you're here going round and round and also going round, what does your path look like? Like some kind of spirograph or whatever. So when he drew this, he said, well, let's have some revolutions here. So you can see Chairman Mao here with the Chinese Revolution. And you have Karl Marx falling off over here. And you have the American Revolution over here. And you have the French Revolution here. And you have Newton and Einstein here. The revolution. You have the French Revolution with the Marie Antoinette and the heads over here. You have Darwin with the monkeys over here, that kind of revolution. And so he just had a good time. Um, you have the Reformation over there as well. Um, this one, it's, it's a good illustration, except, well, that's not why. I chose it because it's an incredible little. One part of it is absolutely incredible. I've taught physics for so many years, and the Doppler effect is very difficult to explain. It's not difficult to explain, but sometimes. So the Doppler effect is when um, a car is moving by, you hear it go, the sound of the car changes. It drops from, or a whistle. So coming toward you, you hear a high pitch. Going away from you, you hear a low pitch. That's the Doppler effect. Um, now, of course, what's interesting is when Christian Doppler figured out this would happen, we didn't have cars going back and forth. And so he said, I have to get a train whistle to blow the whistle. So, and people said, Leave me, I don't believe you. I don't believe you. So he kidnapped three adults, brought them to a hill, strapped them down so they couldn't leave, and then had the train come and blow the whistle so they could hear. And they said, oh, I guess you're right. <laughs> so um, Tomas um, uses the idea of uh, Doppler and Doppeldonger in German meaning double. So he has everything being doubled here. Here's the train, but you know everything is doubled here. But here's what I thought was just incredible. Here are two criminals. You know, you can see their prison suits over here. This one hears the high pitch, the low pitch sound, and he's very upset. This one hears the low pitch sound. He knows the police car is leaving, and he's very happy. So, just with those. He did it. He explained the whole Doppler effect with the frown and the smile and the two police cars. You know, how does he do that? He doesn't know physics. How does he figure out the physics and figure out a way to, as a cartoonist, to communicate something so quickly? But that's what artists can do. They can communicate things which we find difficult. So this one is a Dante quote. And um, I should. Um, let me read the quote. It's, it's a beautiful quote, and then I'll explain it because it's somewhat difficult. It took me a while to understand. O oh, crucified Jove, do you turn your just eyes away from us, or is there here prepared a purpose secret and beyond our comprehension? Is there a secret purpose? Why don't you let us know what's going on? Do you turn your just eyes away from us, or is there a reason you're doing this? So this is the story of the atomic bomb, the atomic bomb. So let me give you a little bit of the story of the atomic bomb, because it's just so, so interesting. As you know, um, in the 1930s, there was a lot of stuff going on in Europe. So in 1935, Enrico Fermi did an experiment. And he showed that if you shot neutron, a neutron into uranium, something would happen that was surprising. But nobody could figure out what had happened. They just couldn't figure out what had happened. And people kept working on it. At the same time, politically, there's the danger 
that Hitler will succeed and all the Jews will be um, killed in Europe. So the Allies, England, America, are trying to get the Jewish physicists out of Europe in 1935. And they come to England, and they come to America, and they're getting them out. 1935, 1936, 1937, Einstein, all of these Jewish physicists, Niels Bohr, everybody's coming out. Fermi, they can't get out because he's a top physicist, and Mussolini won't let him go. But he wins the Nobel Prize. So when he wins the Nobel Prize, they have it all set up that he's going to walk on stage, get the Nobel Prize, then he's going to walk off stage, and the Allies will grab him and get him out of there. And that with his family. And so they get to England, and he's supposed to come to America. When he gets to American immigration in England, because his family was not Jewish, his wife was Jewish, but one of his daughters was blind in one eye. And so the immigration officer said, oh, I'm sorry, your, bl your daughter's blind in one eye, you can't come to America. And then somebody whispers to the Immigration agent, Nobel Prize, said, oh, I'm sorry, you're allowed in. <laughs> so this is just an interesting story. But what's more interesting was, in 1939, after all of these physicists had now emigrated from Europe, Lisa Meitner, Jewish in Germany, um, Otto Hahn and Franz Strassmann realized what had happened when the neutron hit the uranium. And as soon as they realized what had happened, everybody realized very quickly, we can have an atomic bomb. If they had figured that out in 1935, because there, no there was nothing new that happened in the four years, if they had found out in 1935, none of the physicists would have been able to leave um, Europe. But they were all gone, and then they discovered it. And so then the Americans, the English, had all of these people who could then work on the bomb and try to end the war. <clears throat> oh, crucified Jove, do you turn your just eyes away from us? Or is there here prepared a purpose secret and beyond our comprehension? Why did it take four years to figure out that puzzle? Just interesting. Um, I did want to... Um, Tomas describes his cartoon here. Um, Western man and woman wants to know everything that can be known and make anything that can be imagined. Unfortunately, this is a difficult balancing act. One can improve life, but one can also destroy it. Faust has sold his soul to the devil for divine knowledge and now plays with nuclear power. The military in the front row is pleased to get their toys of destruction, while the scientists behind them are more concerned. Even Einstein forgets to play the violin for a moment, and Dante, seeing what's coming, is already writing his Inferno. The regular people are afraid of nuclear power but uncertain what to do, and the animals behind them worry about their own extinction. Beyond the theater, we see pollution and destruction, and while impartial eyes watch from space, they do not interfere. It all may, just be, it all may be just a dream, a delicate balance, a delicate dance on a blue ball without any purpose except to keep everybody on her toes. So this one, I, the, the illustration is so much fun, but I, I, a little quiz here, just like the other quiz. Herman Weil, the physicist, mathematician, said, in my work, I have always tried to unite the true with the beautiful. But when I had to choose one or the other, I usually chose the, well, let's take a vote. <laughs> Did Herman Weil say, in my work, I've always tried to unite the true with the beautiful, but when I had to choose one or the other, I usually chose the true? Or do you say, I usually chose the beautiful? How do you think he said? physicist. I chose the true. How many people think he said the beautiful? The beautiful. <laughs> Just about half and half. He said the beautiful. Now, what's interesting about Weil, what's interesting about the great minds of science is that they say, no, even though this isn't true, it's more beautiful. I think that's correct. And then it turns out 
their beauty turns out to be the deeper truth. That's the wonder of it. So let me tell you how that works so you can get a little appreciation of that. So these are three people, very big, Newton, Einstein, and Bohr. We'll choose Bohr and look at Bohr's theory and see what did Bohr do that was so good? Why is, why is his theory called a good theory? So um, when you take hydrogen gas and you put it in a tube like a fluorescent bulb or whatever, when you put a gas, you put a little electricity light comes out, just like our fluorescent lights. When you use only hydrogen as the gas inside, it gives off four colors of light. Color one, color two, color three, color four. And we can measure the wavelengths of that. So 623 nanometers, 517 nanometers, 418 four distinct wavelengths and colors. And everybody had seen that in the 1800s, late 1800s. Everybody had seen these four colors. But everybody's saying, why these four? Where do these four colors come from? Why these four? And this guy named Rydberg said, a mathematician said, wait, if you use my number, Rydberg's number, then you can figure out the all four numbers for my number. Divide my number by one, divide my number by two, by three, and it, and it turns out. It's a little more complicated than that, but you can get the four numbers. So I said, that's very nice, but where does your, num where does your Rydberg constant come from? And he said, I just made it up, but the numbers work. Look, four things. It, it works. Isn't that nice? And, and it's the way science progresses. Like, it's nice, but not nice enough. So Niels Bohr comes along, and Niels Bohr says, I have a theory about where the light comes from. In my theory of the atom, if the electron circles the atom, I can explain those colors. Now, what's so interesting about this little side note is that when Copernicus said the Earth went around the sun, he was in trouble. When Bruno said he was burned at the stake, a few hundred years later, it's like, it's just like the Earth going around the sun. The electron around the sun. Oh, yeah, the Earth going around the sun. We all agree with that. It's so interesting how times change the outlook you have. But anyway, so Bohr says the electron goes around. But if it has more energy, it goes around not in this circle, but in this circle. And if it has even more energy, it goes around in this circle. And he said, I can calculate the energies of all these circles. And if I know the energies, if the electron jumps from the third to the second, I get the first color. If it jumps from the fourth to the second, I get the second color. The fifth to the second, I get the third color. And the sixth to the second, I get the fourth color. And I know where Rydberg's constant comes from. It's this combination of the orbit, the energy, the moment, all these things. So we say, that's very nice. Bohr's theory is a good theory because it could explain the four colors, but Rydberg did that too but it could explain more about where they came from, and Rydberg couldn't do that. But that's not good enough for science. That's okay for most science, but these people are the grand masters of science. What Bohr then said is, well, hold on. When it goes from three to two, we get a color, four to two, five to two, or six to two. Bohr said, you know what? If it goes from two to one, you'll also get a color. They said, we don't see that color. I said, I did the calculation. The color would have this wavelength, and it's in the ultraviolet, which we can't see. And if it goes from 3 to 1, we get another one in the ultraviolet, which we can't see. And 4 to 1, we get another one in the ultraviolet, which we can't see. But I know what they'll be if we ever get to see them. And if the electron goes from the fourth to the third, we also get a color. Well, where is it? It's in the infrared. Our eyes can't see the infrared. But if somebody ever builds a detector that can see into the infrared, then I can predict the wavelength they will find when they look. And when they built, when Lyman built the ultraviolet detector and Paskin built the infrared detector and looked at the colors of the hydrogen, Bohr got them exactly right. That's a good theory. To be able to explain something everybody knows about, explain something that people know about but they don't know why it happens, and then to be able to predict something which nobody even knows exists. And then when you look, it's exactly as the person predicted. That's the power of science. That's the good theory. So this article was about good theories, but I loved what he did with the cartoon here. So we have all of these wonderful, um, talented people who have walked the earth. We have Shakespeare and James Joyce, the literature up here. Then the next line, we have our painters. We have. Uh, um, who, who cut off the ear? Van Gogh. Van Gogh. 
and uh, da Vinci, you can see the cross here, and Picasso. Then you have the musicians here. You have Bach and Beethoven and Mozart and McCartney. <laughs> and then, this, is, this was like Tomas, really? You have Einstein, Planck, Bohr, Newton, and me. <laughs> it was so sweet. I, I don't belong in that company, but I was really quite um, taken that Tomas would do that. So this is uh, just another one that has to do with the yellow light problem. You see, in America, when a light turns yellow, people have to decide whether to keep going or to stop. That doesn't seem to be the rule in Bangalore. <laughs> um, I, I don't know what happened. The light turns, it, cars just go any way they want. I don't know. So this looks a little like the Bangalore traffic with the person who changes the light sleeping. But um, that, that was the problem, and that, that's why I put that illustration there. Um, and then this one is just another um, interesting physics phenomena because people, well, actually, we have technology now which uses this. The idea is that if you build a, um, a concert hall, you can spend um, tens of millions of dollars building a conference hall, a, a, a concert hall, and the acoustics aren't good. So somebody who buys this seat, they say, I can't hear. I can't hear some of the instruments. Because what happens is the sound comes from the orchestra and it's off the ceiling and they cancel. Sound plus sound makes silence. And so when that happens, and it happened in the New York Philharmonic, they millions of dollars started over and they had to build it again. Because the science of acoustics and the, art of, the architecture, there's an art to it and a science and nobody quite knows how to do it. But you get La Scala or Carnegie Hall or these concert halls where it's just, it's perfect and nobody knows why it's perfect. So, um, so this was an article about waves plus waves can make still water. So here we have waves plus waves make still water. <laughs> we also have sounds plus sounds can make silence. So he's listening to the Simon Garfunkel album, Sounds of Silence. <laughs> you also have, along the top, what is the sound of one hand clapping? The Zen koan. And then, of course, he has, oh, that works with light also. I can actually shine light over here, then shine other light over here, and it'll become dark. If I turn one of the lights off, you see the light again. If I turn them both on, it gets dark. So Tomas illustrated that with the criminal here with the lights and stuff like that. So these are three windows to engage students. Maybe students will appreciate the art and think a little about the physics. Maybe they enjoy the physics, but they'll begin to appreciate art or the literature. Or maybe they came in through the window because words are what speak meaning to them. And the words, the, the literature, they'll say, oh, I, I don't think um, Krishna was thinking of, the, um, of wave-particle duality in light. But it's interesting to think how that resonates with the history of science. This was, I, I, I just put it here because it was the first time I never used the internet for not physics. When, we, when the internet started, um, before we all had it in our pockets and things like that, when the internet started, physicists were using it all over the world to share papers, but there were no pictures, and it was all, you know, words and stuff like that. And we started email, and we started doing email. So we were doing this stuff, but it wasn't used by everybody. There was no Google, there were no search engines, there were no pictures, nothing like that. So I remember at the time that um, Jerry Garcia of the Grateful Dead had just died. And so I decided I should pay tribute to Jerry Garcia and use a quote from a Grateful Dead song. Uh, can I see a show? Does anybody know who the Grateful Dead is? A few. Oh, good. So the Grateful Dead is a, is a band from the 1960s and I'm from San Francisco. <coughs> Anyway, but I wanted to pay tribute to him, and I thought, well, how, the article we're writing is about sound in water. So how does sound transmit through water? And how, do, you know, that's the physics article. I'm saying, where am I going to get a quote? But I want to pay tribute to Jerry Garcia. And at that time, the internet, the, the people who like the Grateful Dead are called deadheads. And the internet was really, half was physics and half was Grateful Dead people. <laughs> that was all. That was the only people who were using the internet. And I said, you know what? I'm going to try something. And I went on the internet and I typed it out, 
to this Grateful Dead website, and I said, can anybody give me a quote that has to do with sounds um, in water that I can use for a physics article? And inside of 20 minutes, I got the answer. I had all these people working on my problem. And so, come here, Uncle John's band by the riverside, got some things to talk about here beside the rising tide. But I got it right away. I said, oh, this internet is here to stay. This is going to be good. <laughs> and I was right. So, this is, um, they, they're called quantoons. Um, Tomas made this up, uh, this word. And, um, and there's a book, the book has um, all these illustrations, of course, there are about 50 of them, and the physics articles, and the quotes, and the solutions to the physics problems, um, which are really quite uh, challenging problems. So, um, but the idea really is that let, now of course Tomas is a very talented artist, and Ovid, and the Bhagavad Gita, and Dante, and Heraclitus know how to write. But our students are struggling to learn how to draw, and they're struggling to learn physics, and they're struggling to learn how to write. And they can also be creative at their level and find interest in the physics that they're studying. Thank you. So now, I'm told, I think I, sit, I pull the chair back and sit right here, and people ask me questions. OK. Are they, are in the diagram, you were at the, uh, the, the lowest row. There are a lot of Arthurs. People will get confused. There is Arthur C. Clarke. There is this one author called like Arthur who was very famous. Yeah, if, if you so look. If, if there is one Newton V, we, we, we may be on the yeah, note. Yeah. I, I, Combining art and literature over here. Yeah, well, he wasn't very kind, and he drew my nose and my <laughs> hairline, and so it looks like me. <laughs> so if, if it is Newton, it is the Newton. Yes. <laughs> if it is Vinci, it is the Vinci. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Do you have questions about the way um, you might use this if some of you are teachers in, in other fields or... Uh, or if, uh, your students, if this um, makes the physics easier for you or more difficult, or is it a waste of time because they don't ask these questions on the upcoming examinations? Uh, yes. I, I'm uh, we're trying to work on an uh, interesting uh, problem of uh, kids which are actually a little bit more to the right side in terms of brains. And uh, so they're not really, uh, you know, they get moved more by the visual. Uh, teams. So one of the ideas that we've been exploring is that uh, is there a different way to probably impart them if they want to learn about maths, uh, you know, science and physics, to you know, dance, music, drama, art and craft and culture. Uh, so that's why it's, it's quite interesting. I missed a lot of lectures because I got caught in the traffic. But uh, quantum, uh, it's, it's definitely very interesting to. So if I can repeat some of that for people who couldn't hear it. Um, the question is, you know, we have some research to talk about right left brain and left brain, the left brain being the logical one and the right brain um, being the more arts or um, aesthetics. And, um, you know, it's interesting because if you have a small child at home and you give the small child, um, you know, you put a pen on the table, they take the pen and they hold it in their right hand and they're stimulating the left hemisphere and they move it over to this hand and they're stimulating their right hemisphere. Then they, and they hear it and they're looking at it and they put it in their mouth to taste it. They're trying to learn about pen. So in our lives we stimulate both hemispheres all the time. We try to stimulate all to better understand the world. But of course some people, I don't know if they have a, they develop it more, they have an affinity for it or whatever it is, but um, you know there are people who they say right brain people. Are there people who can express these things? And the answer is, yes, they can, and again, bring meaning to their lives. So um, I was at a school, and um, they were using uh, my textbook, so I came to see what they were doing. And this, this was a school for students of the arts. They're students who were going to go into theater or music. And um, the girl had just learned about refraction. Um, in refraction, the light goes fast, then it enters the glass and goes slowly, then it enters the air and goes fast again. And she was supposed to illustrate this or explain to the class about refraction. And she was a dance student. 
So what she did was, she took out a piece of cardboard and put it on the floor. And she said, what are you doing? She said, no, no, just wait, just wait. And then she stood over here, and she started doing her tap dance. And both legs moving very fast. Then she moved closer, and when one leg got on the cardboard, this leg was moving slowly, and this one was still moving fast. Then when she got over here, they were both moving slowly. Then when she got over here, then this one left the cardboard and started moving fast again. That's refraction. And I thought, oh my goodness. Yes. Never would have thought of it. This is a 15-year-old girl who doesn't know physics. And we need more people doing that. And, um, and then we can say, you know, there's an equation. <laughs> N1 sine theta 1. Um, but uh, but it, as a teacher, it gives you such incredible satisfaction when the students can teach you when the students can do that. That's the, really the pleasure of teaching. <coughs> Getting to know your students is the, high, is the biggest pleasure. Communicating information, that's good. Um, but when the students can teach you, that's um, probably the best part. Yes? Uh, so um, I would just like to um, quote um, something that I've read on the internet. I found it pretty fascinating. So, um, so our forefathers, uh, or my, my grandfathers, maybe probably read Polity and Warfare so that uh, my fathers can read engineering and science, and then my fathers read engineering and science so that I can read literature and art, and I, I see that's now coming there. But um, so I've been following Ken Robinson, for example, and you know some such authors who are, who are arguing about art and literature and all of these things being very, very beautiful, very important to our society. Um, somehow, uh, at least in India, I see that physics or math take a central position. So now we are into this beautiful uh, thought that we could teach physics through these things. But uh, at the same time, um, is, is it really always necessary for physics or math to be at the center? You know, is, is the question that we are asking. And when you do these things with... We have students, one threat, that's true in America as well. We have the threat that some people um, don't want to fund science research. So, oh, we don't need that science. They're doing stuff that nobody cares about. But they want to use their cell phones. <laughs> you know, so we know that the science and engineering is an economic driver to bring us prosperity. So we need the science and the understanding to bring us prosperity, to bring us, to free us from hunger, to free us from, um, um, from um, sickness, um, because the answer we know lies in science. On the other hand, so we don't want to eliminate the science, and so we, you know, so the, the pendulum swings now to science, like everybody has to become a scientist. And it's like, but no, there are these other things, the human condition. And so another quote you might not be familiar with, um, when um, the Fermi lab built this large accelerator to the tune of many millions of dollars, and the person who was building the Fermi lab, who was in charge of it, went to our Congress to ask for money. And one of the congressmen said, how will this help defend our country? It was the same kind of thing. It's not, it's not, not, not how How will it help, because that's all I care about. How will it help defend our country? And what he said in response was, it makes our country worth defending. Yeah. <laughs> and I think that goes along with your first quote. That we need the arts, we need stories, because stories provide, we need the arts because they provide meaning to our lives and help us structure what the solutions might be, because the science really never tells us how to use the science. That's the people who are in Congress, who in America know very little science, um, who make these decisions. And it's, and the heart also drives what we do. So um, it's a combination. There's not either or. I don't think any of us want to live in a world where, there's a, a cartoon that I think uh, Sidney Harris has, uh, where it's, it's a world of Einstein's. Everybody's walking around and they're, equa they're all thinking of equations. It's like, no, I don't think that's a good world. No, I, I like going to the movies. I like reading literature. I, I like reading stories. And I think we all do. And I, I think we all realize how valuable it is. Um, and we really realize it, it was ever gone. 
as we've seen in some governments where they say, no, you can't have ours. You can't have that. So I, I'm, I'm disappointed because in America as well, the emphasis is now on math and literacy. Science isn't even taught as much in the elementary levels because math and literacy is so important. And art and music and dance, that has fallen off. So I uh, I really actually didn't get the specific answer of whether in your classroom specifically uh, you are engaging them with the art now or the literature now, which is great. But I may still not be getting back with the physics. I may be only taking the uh, you know taking the joy of enjoying your classroom with that art and literature. Uh, as a student, uh, is, is that okay for me in, in your classroom? Um, so the question is. In my classroom, it's all right if a person enjoys the history of physics, the, um, the art of physics, the poetry of physics, but can't do the physics problem, yeah. can't come up with the correct solution. <laughs> I don't know. They always do. <laughs> I think that, I think, um, you know, it, it's, a, it's a very interesting thing. So I, I think back to my teaching, and I remember the first student I had I had been teaching for maybe five or six years, and this, this girl, um, she failed the state exam. And um, I had never had a student fail the state exam. And uh, I was so concerned that she thought I would like her less because she couldn't do physics. I was so concerned that she was worried that I would look at her differently because she failed the course than I was that she failed the course. I didn't <coughs> want her to think that I choose my friends by how much physics they can do, that I judge the value of a person by how many equations they can write. On the other hand, my job is to teach physics, and I want students to learn physics because I do believe that that rainbow is actually prettier when you know why it is that shape, and why it's in the sky the way it is. So, yes? I make uh, science more fun for government school children mainly. Uh, so that's in the you know, grade six to ninth. Uh, and it's wonderful to see that when you demystify an idea, uh, an idea in physics or chemistry or, or biology with a very simple example, like I loved your potato chip vending uh, example. I mean, it was just that moment when you say, aha, so that's what it's about. So, you know, whenever we are able to do that and really simplify it with whatever example we have, it's wonderful to see the way the kids light up. But of course, you know, there are so many problems arriving at that point. So, you know, the way this is put and juxtaposed with, you know, things that you know around you and uh, traffic jams and potato chips and rainbows and things like that. Uh, I, I really see that's the way to go in teaching basic science. And uh, unfortunately, I think in our classrooms, there's very little time to do this. So it's great when we get time out to, you know, really sort of mess around with the idea. So what does it remind you of and things like that. So, I mean, I just... I, well, 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 thank you that, uh, you know, it's, it's wonderful that the approach resonates with you. And I think that the danger is when people think this is going to take a lot of time and we don't have time for this. It doesn't have to take a lot of time. It can be a one minute intervention in a class where you say, oh, let me show you this picture. Or, oh, you can never step into the same river twice. What do you think that means? Or you're reading this book. Well, how do you think the author thinks about technology? It's not the 45 minutes I have with the student. It's a few minutes. But those few minutes somehow provide the incentive and the encouragement and the engagement that a student will stick with the harder ideas. Well, if you don't have that, it's like, I, no, nah, it's not, I don't want to do this. You have to engage the students. No matter what it takes to engage them, you have to find some way. Because if we're not engaged, we are not going to learn. We don't learn, they don't learn. If you're not engaged, you're not going to learn. And in our society today, engagement happens in five seconds. If you go to a museum, a science museum, uh, there's a technology museum here, I but if you go to a science museum, they build the exhibits knowing 
that these people are not in school. They can walk right by, and they know they have eight seconds to engage someone to learn what's in the exhibit. Otherwise, they're gone. When you watch um, an old movie or an old television program, it's slow. There are camera changes every 10 seconds. Now there are camera changes every three seconds or every two seconds. In the movies, things happen so quickly. How do you get students to stop, but you have to engage them? So whatever, whatever it is, we, we try to do. Yes? I just want to share an experience which is very uh, close to what we are talking about today. So I had this uh, child with autism and uh, I was trying to teach him sight words. So what we uh, started doing was we started using cards and uh, first we do the pattern matching. So uh, the words were supposed to be matched. So I was trying the sight words, I, since I did the Montessori training, it was the, is, a, a she, he. So the uh, words which cannot be uh, uh, I mean, spelt phonetically was what we were paired. So I went, I just, child was just not getting it. I was going on doing it and he was just not getting it. So I was wondering where am I going wrong? So I just went to uh, one of my mentors, uh, Ms. Vanita, and she told me that D does not mean anything to this child because he's not speaking, he is not reading. So you will have to work with words which he is used to. Say, what does he like? Does he like chips? So start with chips. Use the word chips and then ask him to uh, pair that. And you will see that he will be, say ice cream, he likes ice cream, he will do that. <coughs> That's one thing which really worked. So I, I, what, the lesson I learned over there was that if you uh, work with a child from what he knows and then take him to the unknown, it is better, it is easier for the child to understand. So anything, anything, physics or history or anything, if you start with what he knows, when we start history, when I learned history when I was a child, I never, uh, nobody really asked me about my family. <coughs> the timeline was never introduced to me uh, like that. It was just that so many years ago, the Ar Aryans came, the Harappa civilization, all these things happened. But when we are doing it with children, saying that, okay, give me a timeline of your day, then taking them to the year, then taking them to history, I think they find it more fascinating. So I, uh, we are now starting the first grade, so we are uh, building the curriculum on these lines. And I think it works beautifully, and it's all about uh, innovation, creativity, and understanding the child. So I think it's, it's, a, it's, it's marvelous, and, so, and it must be so gratifying when you're finally able to help the child and help them see the child break through. I, I, it reminded me of something I'd like to share with you. So um, Tomas, these are, these are paintings. You can see these are very sophisticated. But he, in um, my physics textbooks, he illustrates the books, but with very simple pictures. Um, and in the textbooks, we ask the students, what do you see? That's the way, before we do the physics topic, what do you see in, the, in this little, little picture? And there's a whole group of physics people who say, I can't use that book. It has cartoons. It's not real physics. But that's what they think. But we have the picture there for the special needs students and the e English language learning students, because in America we see lots of languages, I guess here as well. But what we found is that everybody is engaged by the cartoon. But the English language learners and the special needs students who don't like to write, who find it difficult, will all tell you what they see in a cartoon. It's an entry for them. They will tell you, oh, look at the per oh, the person's wearing red socks. It has nothing to do with the physics, but, but they're, in they're telling you something. They can be correct, and they can brought be brought into the conversation. So there's something about that, things they know, things they like. And it's OK if they tell me about the red shoes instead of the light moving. It's OK. It's a start. Yes? Uh, there's this question on my mind, right, from my school days. It's like, um, I'm a commerce student now, and I never had this affinity towards physics because I used to find it very complicated. I never understood any of the terms. And um, in my school teaching, it was just a textbook teaching, so I never got the concept. On the contrary, my sister is an MSE physicist. She's an astrophysics specialist, or whatever she's called. And, uh, Rocket science. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all that I know is she's way too smart because she understands physics. And uh, she's always been that's, my last. That's the myth we like. 
<laughs> and uh, she's always been my last resort to learn something. Like my eighth and ninth, all that I have passed physics is like by heart, write it fast. And in tenth, it never worked out with photo erecting effect. I have no idea why, but I just couldn't learn it. So I went to every possible person other than my sister. Please teach me photo erecting effect. Like teacher, teach it, teach it. And then they're teaching me for hours and hours and I don't understand anything at all. <coughs> then finally one day my sister comes, where are you running around, what's happening? Then I said, listen, I don't want to learn from you because she knows physics well. So she knows the basics, everything. And then she'll scream at me saying, you know nothing, you don't know the basics, how did you pass and all that. <laughs> so I didn't want those things. And um, I'm like, this is the problem. Just teach me this concept and move. Don't ask me any more questions. Then she comes, she tries explaining it to me like, uh, to a person who would know physics and then <coughs> obviously I didn't understand then she said chuck it uh, then she said I learn physics in the way I see how the world runs like suppose I see something I can see science in it I can see physics there and that's how I learn it let me try it on you and then she says you come uh, you come home from school and you're tired mama gives you food you're all energetic then you run around spend your energy you come back you're again tired so that's like that. You get energy, you spend it, and you come back to your normal level. That's what I like to get like. That's what she said. Then she draws two lines, E1, E2, energy 1, energy 2, and explains, and I understand it like that. Then I have a test next day, and the same question comes. I didn't get full marks, but I was very disappointed. I came back to my sister. I said, I know the concept. I know very well how it works. But then I can't put it in terms of physics. Why is it so necessary for me to use physics terms? Isn't it more important for me to understand concept and not the language? And she's like, I'm not a teacher, I can't give you marks, but you know the concept, be happy with it. <coughs> then she went on to giving lectures. And the way she taught there was different. She also expected her students to write because if she would give marks to the concept, it wouldn't be accepted in the university level. Why is a system like this where more importance is given to the language and not to the concept understood? So, um, <laughs> in, different, in different situations, we need different things. So you're a commerce student. So I know how money changes hands. <laughs> and I know if you give me um, 1,000 rupees, I should give you five, um, 10, 100 rupees, and that would be the same. I understand that concept, but if I only give you six 100 rupees, you're not going to be very happy. But even though I understood the concept, you can say, no, I don't care you understand the concept. I want my money. <laughs> so, um, and when we take out our cell phones, um, when our cell phone breaks every third day, we're not very happy, but the person understood the concept who built it, so it should be okay. <laughs> you know, so we make demands on our products that they work all the time, and we need a precision. And so we, at some point, have to help people do that. Now, when people who are not going to be building the cell phones, doing it, then we have to have more latitude so that we say they understand the concept. The, the real danger is it's your sister, so there's so much venom you can build um, for this. But th the problem is that what if you have such a dislike and a distaste for the physics because it was the way it taught. And then, being in commerce, you become a person of power and influence. And the physics community says, can you fund our research? And you say, no. Now it's my turn. <laughs> so I think that I think we have that. But I will tell you, because um, I like this story. So my son um, was recently married a few years ago, and his wife is a lawyer, and she works for the government, and uh, a district attorney, you know, she puts people in jail. Um, <laughs> and um, they're terrible people, they should be in jail. Not all people should be, these people should be in jail. Um, anyway, she, was, she had to take a course on accident reconstructions, what happens with accidents when there's a car accident, who's falls it. So she, so my son called me up and said, Guess what book Kimberly is looking at? And I said, what? She said, she's looking at your textbook. I said, really? I said, yes, she has to take this accident reconstruction course. She's trying to learn some physics. She was never good in physics. And she asked me, would I be able to help her with the physics? And I said, of course. Just call him up. He'll help you. And she said, really? And he said, oh, 
you have to know something. What? He won't give you the answers. And she said, what do you mean? He said, he won't give you the answers. You're going to have to understand it. And she said, no, no, I only want the answers. He said, no, he will not give you the answers. You will have to understand it. And she said, but I only want the answers. And he said, let me say it again. He is incapable of giving you the answer. You will have to understand it. And she never called me. So, help to get a concept or some feel and other things, or to imbibe the curiosity, interest. But you know, I am. Uh, my name is uh, Ramaswamy. I am the professor in aeronautics. But I still find, even for example, quantum mechanics, I don't understand. To go deep into that. It looks like without mathematics, you really can't fully understand physics. I don't know what would you like to say. Um, well, I think it's like that rainbow. <laughs> it's, you know, somehow, too many of our students think that we introduce a way to punish them. <laughs> While the graph is really a wonderful, easy way to understand something, the math is there because it's supposed to make it easier for us. It gives us another insight into something. And again, I don't know why it's always seen as a punishment. I, well, I, I do have a sense. So Feynman, the great, math, the great physicist of the 20th century, um, tells this story. Um, when he was maybe um, in fourth grade, you know, he's only nine or 10 years old, he went over to his cousin's house, who was 14 years old, and said to his cousin, um, what are you doing? And he said, uh, oh, I'm doing my math homework. And he said, oh, what's your math homework? Now, Feynman is, is brilliant. He said, what's your math homework? He says, oh, 3x plus 2 equals 14. You have to find x. And Feynman says, x is 4. And his cousin says, that's correct, but you have to use algebra. <laughs> First of all, there is no such thing as algebra. There is find x. That all you have to do is find x. But because some people have difficulty finding x, we teach them a way of finding x. Subtract 2 from each side, divide each side by 3. The answer comes out to be 4. And you don't have to understand. You can bypass understanding by following this series of steps. But we get people to get the right answer without, while bypassing understanding. And somehow, that's what we do because we don't have the patience or the time to get them to learn how to find x or to find out that learning what x is is what it's about. So, um, you know, we need, we need to do this. I, I mean, it's funny because um, my other son, the one who happens to be very good at science and math, the one who married the <laughs> attorney. Um, because he, he was very much like you. Um, when he was in high school, he was studying physics. And my wife would come home from work, and we would be sitting um, next to each other. And we would just be laughing so hard, tears would be coming. And I'd say, he understands nothing. He understands nothing at all. I don't know how he walks around at night. He understands nothing. Um, my other son is very good at mathematics, and, um, and I, was, I was once so excited um, because I don't get to use calculus um, day to day. It's, you know, it's there. I, I, you know. And I was trying to get somebody to build a bookcase for me. And I wanted the bookcase from the floor to the ceiling. But I knew if you build it from the floor to the ceiling, you can't lift it up because it'll hit the ceiling and it won't. So you have to leave a space. So I had to figure out how much space you have to leave. And I spent a glorious hour writing the equations and saying, oh, this is a minimum maximum problem. I can use calculus, take the derivative, set it. I can find out what it is. And I got the answer. And I felt so good. It was really like just a fun way to spend an hour. And then I went to the carpenter who was going to build this. And I said, so how much space will you leave? And he gave me the number. I said, how do you know? He said, experience. <laughs> and then I still, oh, that was OK. But I told my son, the one who's good at math, and I said, I solved this problem. It was wonderful. He said, 
you don't need to do calculus. The Pythagorean theorem, it solves it. Look, I'll show you. <laughs> and in one minute, he solved the same problem. So this, it's math. It's fun. It, it, it should be fun and should be, you can laugh about it and enjoy when you do it. Yes? But why do you even need to compartmentalize something like physics, literature, art, science, okay, okay, whatever it is? Can't we have a holistic kind of approach to education? We, we, we could, but um, when I hire a teacher, um, I want that teacher to know a lot about one of those things for that <laughs> class. So I'm afraid we might hire teachers who all know a lot of physics and literature and don't know any art, and then I'm afraid of the paintings my son will produce. So, so I think that we specialize, um, and, you know, and the world is so complex now. Um, there was a time in the Renaissance when everybody knew everything. Are we like, uh, limiting our own understanding by doing? I, yeah, yes, we were always. The, we're, we have to limit ourselves. You know how much information is in here somewhere, that internet thing? There's so much. I mean, so I limit myself and I, I read these books and I don't read these books and I, write the, and I write, go to these museums and I don't go to those museums and I meet these people and I don't meet those people. You know, I mean, uh, it's just, it's such a, a, a busy world. We make choices. So um, compartmentalizing is one way. When you decide um, what you're going to, if you're going to go to a movie, which movie to go to, you're compartmentalizing. Do I want a movie which will be very serious and help me learn? Or do I want a movie that's just going to be total, mindless, and make me forget about the whole world? You know, we compartmentalize. So I, I, I think that I'd love if the literature teacher talks about technology in the books. I would love if the art teacher says, why don't we also draw a picture of technical art and be creative that way? So I, I agree completely with the sentiment. Um, in India. I don't know enough about it. Um, I can speak about the science curriculum in the United States. I think that the science curriculum is not the problem. I think that, um, that um, the way it's taught and the way it's interpreted is. So, so, you know, it doesn't matter really what the science curriculum is. It matters what the exam is. Right? The science curriculum, the exam is what drives. You have a curriculum and then you have an examination. And so they're, they're very strongly coupled, the, 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 the thing. So if the, exam, if, the, if the curriculum stayed the way it is and the exam changed, then the instruction could change even though that's the, still the syllabus. It's the exam, I think, which is the driver, not the curriculum. So, um, so I think that if we are going to try to find ways to get more people to learn science, and also appreciate science, it's the exams we have to change, not the syllabus. Um, because I, that, I, that, that's really what I think the driver is, is you study for your exams. It's not, it's, uh, just, just it, 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 from the United States, not from India. I don't know. I, I don't know. Excuse me. Yes. Uh, can you say something about me? My son, grandson is uh, studying in New Jersey. In New Jersey? Great. In the fifth grade, and the science curriculum has three things. One is solutions, the other is force and friction, and the other is about microbes. So from September to January, we've been learning solutions. So they made plenty of solutions and filtered them and you know, all that. I find it's too much. For four months, they're doing the same thing. <laughs> so, so what I would say is that, um, what I would say is that uh, I am so grateful that there is science in the grandson school. <laughs> yes, I'm also grateful. You so, so I think, I think um, we're already halfway there. Now we can make it better. And along the lines you're speaking to, maybe there's a way to make it better. But I'm grateful that in your grandson's school, they are teaching science, and um, and it's probably a struggle for the teacher, and you know, um, but they're doing it, and that, that's wonderful. Just struggling at those. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. Everybody work hard. Yes. Uh, so, the 
last time uh, an Indian has won a physics Nobel Prize from an Indian recognized university was in 1930 by Sir Sivirama. Probably when he did it, we didn't have so much of universities, so much of good teachers also. But 90 years after us, you see there are n number of universities, but still we are not, uh, I, I don't know, the, it, it would take a, another 20 years to take a one number price from any of the universities. So do you feel that the education and the passion to, uh, passion about physics should be taught at the low, the grade level and then carry it on to the university level or where do we miss it? Sorry, 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 just related to that. Just learning in the mother tongue or the vernacular language increase the interest in a particular subject. Especially when you look at the Nobel Prize winners, you look at the people who are uh, having patents and R&Ds. Most of them are probably educated in their uh, one other term. So is there, is there a correlation? Yeah. I mean, it's so interesting. I think the answer to both statements is really um, we have a very large population. This will be the last question. I know people have to leave and stuff. But we have a very large population, big curve, big, big population. If you look at the outliers, the people who win Nobel Prize, you cannot take their experiences and put it back into the general. Roma, Raman, Ra, Raman, Raman spectroscopy, Raman was going to be successful. Um, Ramanujan didn't go to school. He was a successful mathematician. You know, you, we can't take the experiences of these incredible people who are such outliers. They're just like so different than everybody else. Like, what's good for them is what's good for everybody else. That's one of the problems which we had in America, and I think we had worldwide. For a long time, our education system was, let's only focus on the top 5%, and we don't care about the others. But we live in a world now where there aren't jobs for all these people unless they get better educated. And so we have to educate everybody, and that's what we're trying to do now. So um, it's challenging. But I, I think it's always um, dangerous to say, what caused um, Raman to have a Nobel Prize? That would be good for everybody, because we're not all like him. None of us are like him. So I think we, I, I, I can stay and ask questions, but I think we have to call yeah. in and people have to leave, and I don't want to use he began with a He began with a question. I'll end with a question. So on a scale of uh, 1 to 10 on exhilaration, how was this talk? How many of you in 1 to 3? How many of you in 5 to 7? How many of you in 10? <laughs> so you're Einstein of another sort. No? <laughs> well, but uh, I, uh, I happen to place spoiler every time. Because sometime or the other, we have to call it a halt. I think uh, I don't have words to so thank you, Arthur. I, it was truly memorable. And I'm speaking on behalf of every one of us. Thank you very much for being here with us today. Thank you for inviting me. And thank you, thanks to every one of you. Uh, there's a public lecture.